Hello, I'm Carolyn Jones for Washington's Children's Administration. Welcome to this workshop on the web. We are very fortunate to have Mickey Kander with us today. Mickey is a public health prevention specialist with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. He's currently assigned to the Washington State Office of Maternal and Child Health as a mental health consultant. Although some children in foster care have serious mental health problems, there are ways to promote mental health and prevent more serious problems from occurring. Originally developed for physicians, Bright Futures contains information and resources to help you navigate and understand your child's behavior. This is an opportunity to be proactive and to help your child develop to her or his full potential. We hope that you find this workshop helpful. And again, thanks for spending your training time with us. This is a, again, a collaborative effort between Department of Health and, and Children's Administration. Um, what we're trying to do is to talk about the promotion of mental health today, rather than the prevention of mental illness, or far off down the spectrum. Um, I think a lot of people don't really understand that you can prevent mental illness from occurring by doing um, some earlier interventions that can keep kids safe and healthy. Um, we have, some, we have some evidence for doing this training. I just wanted to throw out some quiz questions for you and uh, see what your thoughts were. On average, what is the uh, percentage of kids in Washington State, and anybody can throw out a percentage, percentage of kids in Washington State who have graduated from the, from the foster care system, how many of them have a diagnosable mental health condition? Percentage. I would assume 50% or more. 50% or more. 60%. 60%. 80%. 80. 80. Well, it's 54.4. It's <laughs> um, I can tell many of you have, have um, fostered some kids who <laughs> about 80% of the kids that come through your home probably have mental health conditions. Um, and in the United States, what, what is the approximate percentage of kids who have mental health problems? So in general, the general population. 25? Do I hear any other? I would say 10. 30%. 30%. 50. 50. <laughs> um, it's 20%, so it's one out of five. And about five to nine percent of kids, uh, five to nine percent of kids, so here's 20, here's five to nine percent, have a significant, have a diagnosable mental health condition that impacts their ability to live their daily lives. So you have foster kids, one out of every two. And then you have you have normal you have kid normal kids sorry I shouldn't say that kids in the regular population one out of every five so there's a pretty big disparity in terms of kids who are um, who are mentally ill in the foster population versus kids who are in the general population. Um, what is the uh, what is the number of placements um, a foster child will go through before his or her mental health begins to go downhill on average? Three. Three. Any other takers? Two. Two, five. <laughs> I love this. Great. Uh, it's like a bidding game. Um, it's four. And on average, you know, kids in foster care, about 63% of them um, remain in the home that they were placed in in the first year. So it's pretty easy to switch around often. So that's why we're talking about this stuff today. Um, and you as foster parents are, at, and, and, and supported allies, um, are folks who can provide some kind of some kind of resilience for them. Um, in the Federal Review of Child Welfare Programs, Washing, uh, that Washington State underwent, as well as uh, many other around the around the country, um, the finding was that if foster parents knew how to access mental health resources, if they knew about mental health, period, that they were less likely to have disrupted placements. Duh, <laughs> because. People know how to access services and to alleviate some of the problems that people might experience in foster care. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the impetus for what we're talking about today. And we're also using the Bright Futures reference material that's in front of you. So one, we're gonna, Kristen's going to go over mental health promotion, honoring the assets of our foster families. Um, we're going to introduce you to the Bright Futures materials. These are these lovely toolkits that are here in front of you. You're going to break off into small groups and and. And work on and work on a couple of things in them, so you get familiar with the materials. And you're going to report back on what you find out. Lunch today is on us, so you guys don't have to go out to Jack in the Box or um, you know wherever else around here. Uh, and so far, the lunches that we've had have been pretty good. 
Then in the afternoon, I'm going to do an overview of common conditions impacting kids in foster care. We don't often talk, we're not going to focus a whole lot on treatment issues today because treatment is sort of at the other end of the continuum. We want to do prevention and promotion, so the earlier end. Then we have a panel of community partners. We have five community partners um, who are coming in to do a mental health panel for you guys. Uh, that includes an RSN person, um, a school psychologist, a foster care assessment program provider, a school nurse, uh, and I believe one more professional. And what I challenge you to do is you see these yellow baggies that are here up on these tables, um, is to come up with at least one question for the mental health panel because these folks know about mental health services in this area and we want to make sure that you get your questions answered as opposed to that video store phenomenon. I don't know if any of you ever walk into Blockbuster and you knew exactly what you wanted when you were at home but the moment you walked through the door it just totally slipped your mind. You had no idea what to do. So you ended up looking through all of the aisles to find your video and then eventually you just settled on Beetlejuice or something <laughs> great. So anyway, um, in order to curb that, that's why these cards have been put out. Um, they're around the tables. And please put them in these bright yellow, bright yellow baggies. So I challenge you to come up with at least one question each. Um, then we're going to do a break, and then Treehouse, uh, which is an organization that works on foster kids and education, is going to come in and do a uh, presentation on 504 plans and IEPs, on how schools can help promote <laughs> mental health of kids. And it's a great presentation. So any questions about the agenda before Kristen begins? Okay, well then we can go ahead and get started. Today we're, we're just going to be exploring some of the mental health promotions and introducing you to some of the tools that are available to you. Uh, Mickey did mention about, about the books that we have. Um, we are going to be using them today, so you'll get an idea of, of how to use them. Um, we, as, you know, as foster parents, we struggle a lot with how to help our kids um, with different issues, um, how to better their mental health uh, in issues of um, because a lot of these kids as you know um, come with uh, from from families that that don't have um, a lot of support for these children so it's up to us to start to develop uh, some of the changes in their lives and um, a lot of the families um, don't know how to uh, help their self-esteem or other areas like that so we're hoping that these tools will help you out with that and to also remember that these kids even if they're young one thing that I've noticed with my daughter I have I have two um, girls that were both babies they're half siblings and uh, I noticed that with my six-year-old who's now six she has started to develop some some different um, mental health issues, um, some of the things that we weren't expecting because I've had her since she was a baby. So sometimes you don't realize what's genetic that might come and it was good to have some training, some understanding of what to look for and what to do. So hopefully these tools will help you out with that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so we also want to understand, to better understand the strengths that are, that these kids bring and that you bring as foster parents and also the strengths that your team might bring. As you know, we talk a lot about teamwork in, in foster care where you have the CASAs and the social workers and the teachers and the foster parents and the children themselves, all part of a team. And it's important to pull everybody's strengths together. And so we want to also focus on that. Let me ask you what you think of this statement. When I feel mentally healthy, I feel what? Happy. Okay. So Mickey's going to write some down. So if you can just kind of tell me what you, what you think. Confident. Secure. Safe. Serene. Energized would be a good way. That's good. Balanced. Ah, that's a great one. Hopeful. Love. Any others? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that was good. So how often, what do foster kids usually feel when they're in the system in terms of their mental health? Insecure. Lost. Angry. Confused. Angry. Abandoned. Yeah. Misplaced. Fearful. Fearful. Lonely. 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 If you notice that there is obviously a difference between how you feel when you feel mentally healthy and sort of what the what most kids 
probably in the foster care system are feeling, especially when they first come into it. Mental health can be considered um, the capacity of each of us to feel, think, and act in a way to enhance our ability. Um, the ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we face based on self-esteem, coping skills, social support, and well-being. So the, some of the things that we talked about earlier, some of the things that you've brought up, um, the, the I feel being how you feel and then the foster children, you can see how self-esteem issues, uh, what are some of the self-esteem issues that we listed? Oh, confident, secure, hopeful. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's important um, to relate what, what, how you feel and how the foster children feel um, to mental health. Yeah. I mean, if you notice, these things that, we, that kids can develop based on, based on whatever, it is that they're, whatever their circumstances, these things can keep them resilient against, against mental illness later on. And notice, when you mention these things, how well these things particularly jive with those particular skills that kids would develop. Um, okay, so mental health promotion, which is what we're talking about. We're not really diagnosing. What we're doing is promoting mental health, um, uh, improving their, their uh, mental health, and offering them the ability to um, be, or actually, I'm sorry, enhancing individual community and capacity to control their lives and improve their mental health. So uh, there's foster individual resilience, uh, promotes socially su supportive environments, and uh, promotes respect. So that's a lot of areas that foster children do have issues in. Uh, respect is, is one of the big ones. I know I have, I have a reactive attachment disorder child, and his respect for authority figures is very difficult. Uh, I don't know if you know that much about reactive attachment disorder, but it is a, a challenge, especially he was brought up by his sisters uh, who were a year and two years older than him. And so uh, for him to respect adults was very difficult because it was his sisters who brought him up. So we've, we've had to work on that. And so you really want to um, remember their environments and then help them um, get back to where they should be. So we did have him in a lot of relationships with adults uh, to help with his relationship with them and to respect society, which is, which is very difficult for a lot of these kids. They've been done wrong by society, so it's very difficult for them to have that respect. Um, also, getting kids involved with the community. Uh, a lot of these kids really haven't been. School may have been their only time that they were really social or with or being able to interact and their only environment or their um, exposure to the outside world. A lot of these kids get moved from one area to another and it's really difficult for them to adjust from being in say Seattle and then moving to Enumclaw. It's a huge cultural difference and so to be able to get them involved with the community will really help that. Yes. I, I think one of the issues that I've seen that took place over the years with the foster care system is that often or not, most most of the children, except you get the earlier ones, but most of the children that end up are older. And so it's kind of like a two-step problem. I know you say we want to prevent these issues before they become a real issue. Clear, that's the best approach. But often or not, there's not enough efforts put on even after you get an older child and how to really help this child. And so I am glad that this process is taking place. But there is like a two-set difference. Mm -hmm. you know, like well, there is a point of identifying where their delays are or where the areas that they really need help with and then seeing where there's, there's a difference between normal behavior and what's beyond where you're going to need professional assistance. Wherever so that may be. The foster kids that I uh, help raise is, is definitely older, like seven, and show me a child at seven, and they're already got a tremendous amount of problems and been identified, but we don't know how to really resolve them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's shown once they hit the age of six, it, it, it's harder and harder the older they get to be able to, to give them support. Um, but a lot of this is also going to introduce, I know as being, when I was a new foster parent, I wish they had information like this. I know from the pre-service uh, um, pre that we had, um, even in 99, which isn't that long ago, there wasn't a whole lot of training involved with, they threw out all these different things, well, there's, you know, attachment disorders and there's, you know, this or that, and, and they really didn't go into any detail of, okay, 
So what do I do? And I, I was a brand new parent. I never even had kids of my own. I never even babysat. So my <laughs> husband and I went into this. We really had no clue even, you know, normally what do kids do in a normal family situation. And we sort of made it up as we went along. And so having, at least having the understanding of, well, this is what you can do to help promote this. And it would have really been helpful if I could have just opened a book that said, okay, how do I, how do I uh, you know, deal with my, my child who's angry? You know, they're, they're sitting there screaming and yelling at you, and you're just like, okay, what do I do? Um, because as a foster parent, you're really limited on what you can do. And, and you want to have those skills ahead of time. So I'm really glad that there are some new foster parents in here. And I know that there's some veteran foster parents in here. And, and so even to, it's never too late to know that. So if you, if you can familiarize yourself with how to build their self-esteem or how to um, you know, help that respect level, um, understanding boundaries and, and things like that, because it's something that they're not used to seeing, can, can really help. And then you can start narrowing down on, OK, this is not normal. Uh, when, you know, when my son was really having issues with, with respecting authority and there was manipulation issues going on all over, I kept thinking, OK, this is not right. And I had no clue what reactive attachment disorder was. And so there's a point where you see, okay, this is not what is in the book. <laughs> this is not how you would expect normal children to act. So that's when you start seeking professional help from there. And so you're going to get to the point where you're going to find what you can work with and then what you're going to need some help with, whether it be a psychologist or a therapist or, or the uh, teachers or social workers, but there's somebody in there that then you're going to need to bring in help. So I think you have to first identify where the issues are, which is, you know, as a foster parent, this is where we have the, the biggest advantage because the kids are in our home all the time. But it also is a disadvantage of having so much experience. I found myself overanalyzing my kids. And I, okay, there's a problem here. Oh, I better take her to the therapist here because this isn't right. But you wind out overanalyzing. So I think it's really important to understand what's normal. I think it's important for you to understand how you can help and support these children without having to bring in professionals. And then you're going to assess that there's a point where you're going to need a professional involved. And I think that's what you were kind of talking about with the older kids, that there's, there's a point where you're going to need professional help. So you really don't want to diagnose these kids yourself and try and deal with it yourself because you really need that outside support. My, my son dealt a lot better with, um, with a therapist once we found one that he could relate to. Um, he, it just, he's gone just unbelievable changes that he's made. He still will always have issues, but at least he's on the right track to really be able to be in society. Um, my daughter's just starting out getting some of these issues. She's got some ADHD issues and, and uh, she has uh, impulse control issues, so she steals a lot. And so this isn't something that we promoted. <laughs> Let's go steal things that we want to make you feel better. It was what, what was internal for her. It was, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I miss you know, my friend who's not with me anymore. Whatever it may be at the time, and she'll see something that she wants, and she takes it. And it just doesn't connect that you just can't do that. So for her, we've been working at it, trying to figure out, okay, how can we, you know, we, we are very positive, praising her when we can, uh, when she, you know, goes through a day where she, you know, finds another way, some tools that we've given her to deal with when she's sad or what to do. She does a lot of, of coloring and drawing. Uh, she talks to her teacher. She's got a great relationship with her teacher, but she still, when she gets really depressed, that's what she'll do. She'll go and steal, and then we have to deal with it then. And we do have a professional helping us at that point because we know it's not something that, that we can then, then do. So, um, th so that's what you're going to run into is you're going to find those, those stopping points where you just got to move on to professional, get your team involved to help out. But with these tools, I think that's really going to help you um, to, to be able to assess that better. So one of the, the most important things, which is a lot of times the hardest for us as foster parents, is finding our strengths, finding our own strengths, finding strengths in our team that we work with, as well as finding the strengths in the children. And if you, if you think about um, the kids, well, actually, let's look at this. Um, what's right with you is more powerful than what's wrong with you. What do you guys think of that? 
It is. Anybody but, disagree? <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with that. Uh, I, 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 would, I could easily look at it the other way and think that the things that are wrong could definitely, you know, impact and supersede the good impulses. So even though I know probably in social, oh, sorry, you know, the mic is here. Maybe in social welfare uh, circles, you want to always emphasize the positive. I'm not sure that, that psychologically even that that's the best approach. Because it may be that those few things that come up over and over and over again, like your daughter's thieving, I have a foster kid who lies all the time. Frankly, that's causing so much havoc in us trying to deal with him that I really have to say in his case that some of the things that are wrong with him are the things that really need to be addressed. And it's true. And, and obviously there are things that that are wrong that you do need to be focusing on and it does take over um, you know one of the things that affected my daughter um, with my son was that we had spent so much time dealing with his issues that I was actually not giving her the time that she should have had and it affected her by then her behaviors coming out trying to get my attention and copying what he was doing and being inexperienced you learn that the hard way that that's what happens um, and so it really it really did take a, a lot of work for me to see what was right about him what his strengths were um, what can we focus on to get him off of this other part and it was the same thing with my daughter it's like we knew what she was able to do we wanted to be able to focus in on that and so that that she could get that attention she needs that time with us she needed and to be able to promote the the right things in her but it's true that the, the wrong things do stand out yes yeah, I, I think what he's saying is really true though uh, you really need to know both sides of the situation it's just like with alcoholism if you're in denial and you don't face the fact that you've got that problem it's really hard to see that you've got the good, good sides to it mm -hmm. so you need to accept both mm -hmm. it's control, true control the bad and, and uh, feed the good mm -hmm. right and by feeding the good, I think that that's what this statement is talking about is the powerful part. And it's, I think what we, how we, what we value, if we value, po if we value sort of people being positive, then, then it can be more powerful. If we, if we value the negative or if the negative is taking over us, then that feels positive, more powerful at that time. Vermont found that um, if the more assets you had, the less likely you're to have poor mental health. So I think that that's what they were trying to get at with this particular statement. Not that we need to ignore or blow off the negative because what you're here to prevent something negative from happening so obviously you need to know about that so um, just to reframe what that statement is saying I was gonna say I've had strength based training before and I really like that statement but what threw me was the word wrong to me that's so negative and uh, so I'd rather have it say what's not right with you or something else and it's just wrong throws out such a negative statement. Yeah. Me, um, when I see that, I think it's definitely true. And I think for the kids that we interact with, they don't know what's right with them. They That's don't right. know what their strengths are. They don't, a lot of times, don't know they even have any. So, I mean, I think it is more powerful when you know it's there and you can work with it. But I think what gets missed is, you know, you're doing this. I don't want you to do that. Don't do this this day. Quit doing that. And I think... What is, is good about them, what they do well, is just missed. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of how we, we function sometimes. We take the things that are most annoying and, and don't mm -hmm. work and focus on those. And the things that do work, we just kind of leave them alone. <laughs> so based on that, let's try a small exercise. Somebody give me a strength of the child in their home or a child that they're working with um, that may potentially be difficult or whatever. But anybody have a strength of, of a child they're working with? I saw two sisters yesterday, and I was very impressed with the way that they interacted with each other because you think siblings, and you think they bicker, they fight, they punch each other out, they pull each other's hair, and these girls shared with each other, and they, they had come out of a very neglectful environment. I was very impressed with their ability to help each other. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Next. Perseverance. 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 Did I hear another one? Determination. Anybody have a foster kid who's a great athlete? Yes. I have one who's a writer. Writer. 
Sense of humor. Humor is so important in our job, isn't it? Mechanic. Can I ask you how easy is it to come up with these versus these? Can anybody comment about it, whether it was more easy, easier to come up with these versus versus the ones we were just doing talking about? It takes time to, to dispel uh, the previous habits they have and conditions they've lived in, mm -hmm. and by getting gaining strength and friendship. Uh, that it really helps the child excel much I, I also really think that too often as even parents or counselors, you get in the process of tying yourself to the, to the negatives when you go to look at something, and you've got to approach it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. you, have to you look for the problem. So it's, it's an attitude or state of mind that whatever the foster parent or whatever role you play, that's the role you need to be in. Right, so it's easier to focus on the negative is what you're saying. Okay, there was somebody else in there. That's what he said, okay. <laughs> and then... Sorry, Linda. So when uh, <laughs> children come to our home, they present to us usually negative behaviors first. So that's what you see first. And you have to know them a little longer before you um, begin to see their other qualities. Mm -hmm. They don't normally come into us being a great athlete with a wonderful sense of humor or, you know, presenting themselves right. that way. Right. So it's important to kind of be on the lookout for those things, sort of like a cop or a detective or something to figure out what and it takes and it takes work because it's really like everybody was saying it's a lot easier to focus on the negative and and sometimes you focus on that going oh I have to help this child we've got to focus on this but you're forgetting about all the other areas that you need to keep working on too it's, it's a big job especially with our kids because they're not already coming with some of these skills some of these abilities and and having that that person in their life being able to build their self-esteem and, and other parts so it's, it's really good that you're you're thinking about some of the strengths that they have and, and you're finding those because those are a lot of times what you can really build off of as you guys know so what you need to also do is do remember about all the other areas and that list of the 40 assets is really, really a good tool. There's one of them that's in there for children and then one of them that's in there for older kids. And, um, and so it really, it really is helpful to kind of go through this list and see. It's, it's about support, empowerment, boundaries and expectations, construction, constructive use of time, um, commitment to learning, positive values, social competencies, and, and positive identity. And there's a lot of areas that you just you kind of forget that you should be focusing on. And this is what's going to help all the other areas of their, of their life. So it's really important to, to get, a, get a look at that, get that in your head. Um, I know with, when I did, um, or went through Love and Logic training, did anybody else do that? Love and Logic training? Oh, you guys got to do that. It's a great training. It was actually a training that was developed for reactive attachment disorder children. Uh, but it's a great for just everyday life. It really gives you the skills to be able to uh, give children choices, how to deal with different um, issues that come up. And one of the things that they have you do is, um, as a parent, is you can write down some of those things that you keep forgetting or the, the answers that you want to give them when they uh, say certain things. Um, my son was really good at manipulating, so he would constantly say the same thing over and over again to kind of mentally torment me. And so I would have some automatic responses that I would say, and it would kind of just kind of throw him off because there's something totally out of the blue. And I had little post-it notes around the house, so he knew that I would say them. So it was, it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting uh, way of parenting, but it really is useful. And I was noticing that a lot of the things that are on this list are part of that training. But there's a lot of other great trainings out there on, on parenting and, and dealing with different issues. But as I was looking through this list, I was realizing, wow, I'd forgotten about that, and I should have been looking at that. Um, and, and so you know, take a look at that list. These are some of the uh, strength-based approaches. Some of you mentioned, for example, supporting mastery. So I heard somebody say writer. You know, uh, Being a masterful writer is something that if you develop skills in. Um, being able to identify strengths. As you mentioned back there it's hard to sometimes when you and it takes a while for you to finally um, get them out, but eventually, I heard from you earlier, sense of humor, so there, you can at least identify something. And then start with what's right, um, focusing on sometimes, even though it's very difficult, um, building on those strengths and making, and making kids aware of what they can do correct um, can have a profound impact on how they feel about themselves later on. I do want to let you know that um, 
I recently completed a statewide children's mental health needs assessment, um, which is no small undertaking. But we did find that there were certain factors that really influenced um, influenced how well kids fared in terms of their mental illness, mental health. Sorry. So, can somebody tell me the number one thing that protects a child's mental health? Mom. Yes. Yeah. It's a relationship with uh, with a responsible adult, somebody who cares greatly for them, and that the child knows. Um, cares for them. So that's why this is, these trainings are so important for foster parents and CASAs and whoever, um, is because you can be that person. You can be that source for them. So what we want to be aware of is, is their development. Um, this is emotionally, physically. I did notice that when my son was placed with us at five and a half, he was very small for a five and a half year old. It was very interesting. And then as we were able to, to connect and, and help him build some strengths and different areas and work with the therapist, he started growing. He's like really big now. So it's just, it's amazing how, how your mental health can really affect your, you physically um, and emotionally too. Um, continual change in growth. Um, obviously you was mentioning that about my, my daughter and how more she grows, other issues are coming up, other things are coming up. There, there are changes. You know that each developmental stage brings a whole new issues, different things to have to deal with. Uh, the importance of relationships. As they get older, there's uh, obviously when they're babies, their relationship with, with you as a parent, their siblings, then they grow into going to elementary school, and they're going to be dealing with teachers and how to deal with their peers and how to deal with neighbors. Uh, we live in a great neighborhood, and we happen to live in the back of the neighborhood, so we don't have very many people from the outside coming in. So we're really involved with our neighbors in, in our particular community. And and trying to uh, uh, teach my daughters about, um, you know, well, we know these people, but we don't know these people. So being safe and, and uh, relating with other people. And then there's um, also the fact that, you know, my, my, my daughters are adopted. So we've always, you know, introduced them to their, their birth parents when they were older, um, as in, you know, you had birth parents, which, which we called for my daughter to, to be able, my daughters to be able to understand, is we had her tummy mom and her forever mom. And so that's how we were able to introduce that to her. And so it's a continuing to understand that relationship and how, well, yes, you're not going to see her again, but she, you know, is your time out. You have other siblings out there. We've had one in our home before uh, who went with his birth father. So she remembers that. So there's a lot of relationships, especially with our kids, that get very uh, complicated. Uh, my, my son has two older sisters who are adopted by another family who live in Colorado. So my son would talk about um, his sisters, and my daughter would go, okay, but I'm your sister. So there's a lot of different uh, relationships in there. So who, hears know, who here knows what a, um, what a quinceañera is? Yes. What is a quinceañera? It's a, uh, it's a Hispanic tradition for girls when they turn 15 sort of like a wedding, it's a big fiesta, they become women. Right. The transition for, for, um, for Latina girls to go from uh, young girls to young women. So if, a, if a, a girl at that age, if a girl in the Latina culture does not experience a quinceañera, what are some of the potential repercussions for her later on in terms of culture? Well, if she's never been raised in the culture, she won't know. But if right. she's part of the culture and she doesn't, she'll feel odd, left out, and like she's not like anybody else. Mm -hmm. Maybe she might even be developmentally stopped to that 15. Yeah. So just one thing to keep in mind is that, is that with culture, to, to, it's always important to keep these things, uh, when you're thinking about mental health and culture, is that th some things are not always pathological. They just might be culturally related, and that we need to make sure that if we're um, looking at other cultures, how to, how to view it through a culturally appropriate lens. Okay, so, so every, every child deserves a bright future. And um, every child deserves to be healthy, experience joy, have self-esteem, have caring family and friends, and succeed in life. As foster parents, we know this. Or working in the industry, you know that um, it's very important for these children to have that sense of security, um, to be happy. A lot of these kids don't, haven't experienced that enough. And so we have that ability to give them that. Self-esteem is always going to be an issue with our kids. They're, they're, I, I have yet to meet a foster child who doesn't have self-esteem issues. So that's always going to be something that that's, uh, needs to work on. And then to succeed in life. 
life. I mean, our goal for our son was to find a way that he can fit into society, um, that he can be, you know, that he can understand what's what's required of him, and and really to to be able to help these kids, um, support these kids in being able to be successful. Um, and connecting them with family and friends. We know how difficult it is when the kids move from one place to another and they have to give up their friends and their, and their family. And it's very difficult. And it's, so it's, it's, you know, positive side of it is connect them with new friends and new family members and to realize how big the world is and how many people there are out there to relate to. So we're hoping that you have that uh, opportunity to be able to promote that healthy side, that mental health side of, of their lives, and um, to be able to um, you know, strengthen these different areas that they have. To give you a really brief, 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 brief overview, overview of what, um, what Bright Futures is, um, a few years ago, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau um, became very concerned about well child checkups, um, which is what a physician is supposed to do um, for kids in, that, are, that qualify for Medicaid in terms of taking a look at them and then providing kind of a holistic assessment of what's going on with that child. So nutrition, physical activity, oral health, you name it. Um, and one of those things was mental health. And what they decided to do was to contract with Georgetown University to develop these set of, these set of books um, uh, that help physicians to take a look at mental health issues as well as other things. So in front of you, you have the mental health guidebook. Just because I said they've been geared for physicians does not mean that you have to have an MD to be able to read them. They are user friendly and that's why we thought that um, you guys would be able to take advantage of them. So what is Bright Futures? Well, it's really a vision. Remember the prior slide where every child deserves to be healthy, happy, carefree, you know, drive a Lamborghini, be, you know, those kinds of things. Um, Bright Futures is a vision that all children will have those things and all children will be that way. Um, it's also a philosophy. The philosophy is, is, that you, um, is that the materials and the information that you find in this book can help them get to that vision. Um, and then a set of expert guidelines. These things were not created in a vacuum. We, they didn't, Maternal and Child Health Bureau did not contract with a guy named Bob to go sit in a closet and then write this book. This was done in conjunction with a number of people who are experts in their field in terms of child development and mental health. So they really know what they're doing. And what I'm trying to say is that there's some credibility associated with it. Um, when I also say guidelines, I want to emphasize that they are, in fact, just that. They are guidelines. They are not the end-all, be-all, concrete rules that you must follow in order to have a healthy, successful child. You can, you can switch them around as much as you want. For example, um, when we break up into groups later, there's going to be a section on family meetings. And one foster parent, um, the last time we met, um, talked about candlelight dinners as a family meeting. She's like, it's not necessarily a family meeting where we have necessarily a purpose, but we come together to talk about these things, and that's, that falls within the realm of a family meeting. So just to keep in mind that these things are not hard and fast, you can, you can put your own little spin on it and be creative. Um, and then it's practical developmental approach to providing health supervision. You will notice on the side of your manual that you have these colored tabs. And it's not just because the Maternal and Child Health Bureau is colorblind or other such things. It's that they want that these things are broken out based on developmental stage. So infancy all the way through um, age 21. So if you need information specifically about an adolescent in terms of mental health, you can go directly to that section. Bright Future Support. So why do you think uh, we would have all of these organizations listed on this slide here for you to see? Yeah, so you can contact them, right? I've got home numbers for all these people. Um, now the well, true. I mean, so you can, and the research. So it's credibility. So all of these, all of these folks have sort of bought off on the material that you're taking a look at. Um, I always like to ask people. So what do you think nap nap means? <laughs> Is an organization that promotes napping in the no, I'm kidding. It's a <laughs> National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Um, so I don't know why we haven't actually spelled that out yet. We probably should. But anyway, all of these folks have bought off on the have, have you know said we agree with the information that is in these books. All right, the Bright Futures core concepts, the concepts that sort of the that are built um, into this book and the framework that. Prevention works, that primary prevention works. Primary prevention versus tertiary prevention being you stop it before it happens. 
that you can keep it from getting worse if you act early on. Um, anybody not necessarily not agree with prevention working? Doesn't work all the time, but it works. It, it, it does work quite a bit. We use that in public health often. For example, in immunizations, um, in public in anti-smoking, you know, campaigns. Um, you know, by preventing things before they start, you can prevent lung cancer. You can prevent infectious disease. So with that, we can also prevent mental illness. And that families matter. If you leave here today and think that you don't matter, it, that the relationship you have with a child doesn't, won't impact their mental health, I have failed as a trainer. Um, families are extraordinarily important in terms of providing um, health supervision and health guidance um, to kids, especially in the foster care system who have had um, potentially poor role models before. So it's important to it's important to know that, that you as, as foster parents, as CASAs, as social workers, um, know that families are essentially important and that health is everyone's business. Um, one thing that came out of some recent research in Vermont found that a, a child's mental health, um, we talked earlier about relationships being very important and that love is uh, essentially important, but that health is everyone's business in that perspective, meaning that if it, uh, an important relationship can come from the bus driver, can come from the lunch lady, can come from a casa, can come from a foster parent, it can come from anybody, a neighbor, you name it, as long as the child has a good relationship with somebody. Um, and that it's everyone's, it's everyone's responsibility to pitch in to help for everyone's health. So here's the Bright Futures materials for professionals. You'll notice that the mental health one is up here. There's other ones here for nutrition, physical activity, and oral health. I wish we could have afforded to give you all of the books, but we, um, we're poor. So uh, we, <laughs> what I want you to know is that you can download any of these things for free online. You don't have to wait. You don't have to have us uh, pay for it. Um, and it's at brightfutures.org, and I can show you that way. And you have that website on your, on your handouts as well. Here are materials for families. Um, there's the child health record, so you know, similar to how you have an immunization, immunization record, your child's health record has all of that information right there for you. The other thing is today you're walking out with one of these, one of these things. Um, it's a health organizer. Um, this isn't just, you know, because we wanted to find something fancy to put your attachments in. It's so that when you have a child in your home, you can better organize their health information. How many foster parents get every single piece of medical information and social and health and mental health information possible in the history of a child when you get them? Never. Okay. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> no, but how many costs get? How many? Yeah. How many? Did, right. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't happen very often. One thing that we wanted to make sure when we were going through the curriculum advisory panel is to talk about the, re, the, the um, ideal world of what you would get as foster and the reality. And the reality is you don't always get this information. Wouldn't it be great if a former, if the, if the placement just before yours gave you this afterwards and said, you know, the child's been in my home for a year. Here's all of their health information. And I've gone over it with him or her and they know that it's in here and it's available for them. And they are, they, I've taught them how to be good stewards of their own care. So rather than focus on you know, what we can't have, what you can do as foster parents is start, being, is start being the historian with them as well, which I think is great for CASAs because CASAs don't change with, with foster kids. They stick around with them even through placements. Does that go with the child when they grow out of the system? It's up to you. I mean, if you want to keep it with you and then take all the stuff out and then use it for another child, it's, up, it's, it's, it's your choice. You can do whatever you want. This is your gift from us, so you can choose to do that if you'd like. And there are other, there are other things here. Um, there's encounter forms for families. Um, that's the only thing, unfortunately, in maternal and child health uh, Bureau that, ha that, is, um, that is in Spanish, everything else is in English. I know that there are some efforts to try to put it into um, different languages, at least I know there are some concerns out there, so I know they're trying very hard. All right, and then Bright Futures in Practice Mental Health, these are the, um, these are the materials that you see before you, and it um, pretty much focuses on health promotion, and we're going to talk about some of the uh, skills and, and toolkits 
that are coming with it. So just FYI, this is sort of like your reference book. So think of this as kind of your, kind of your textbook. You know, when you're a kid, you have your reader, um, and then you have your workbook. So when I was second grade, the nitty gritty city, I think, is what I had. Was, and then I had my nitty gritty city workbook. So essentially, this is going to give you the information that you need. This is going to give you the skills and the tools. So you don't feel like you just know about it, but something here's something, a list of things, a menu of items that you can do something about it with. So developmental issues by age, we talked about that, prevention and early recognition. So when promotion fails and it starts to get into prevention and early recognition of mental health conditions, it gives you an idea of what to look for. And then bridges on page 187 of your large book. You don't have to look at it now. Um, the uh, the book has bridge information about health topics that, uh, that are mentally health related. So for example, like eating disorders, panic attacks, anxiety, you name it, it's going to be in there. And it relates it to other health conditions. And then the toolkit, we, are, we already just talked about that. So internet resources, these are the ones that you're busily writing down um, a lot. Uh, what I would recommend is uh, if you go to any of these at all, go to this one because this is the one that has all the PDF files um, for you. The, and PDF, you need Adobe Acrobat, which is a free, which is free software. You can download it online if any of you um, don't know what that is. And it usually comes with a little box there. You'll see just to hit, click it, and download it right onto your computer. Bright Futures at the American Academy of uh, of, of Pediatricians, Pediatrics. Um, they have bought off on it, and it's on their website as well. Gosh, this is, can, it's. I'm having a hard time seeing this. <laughs> um, Bright Futures of Washington State. This is where I am at the Department of Health. We have our own Bright Futures website. And then the University of Washington has, um, has a Center for Development where they, work on, um, where they work on the promotion of Bright Futures materials. And in the last year, we've actually uh, had a training for nurses, school nurses on this material. So there are a number of them around the state who have access to this information just like you will. So here's what the American Academy of Pediatrics website looks like. Um, you know, if you want, you can go here to Families and Communities and check out some of the information that they've got on Bright Futures. And here is the one, this is the website I said, if you, if in fact you um, visit any of these websites, go to this one, because this one has oral health, mental health, nutrition, physical activity, all of those other things that you can do to promote your child's health in general. What you're going to do is you're going to have the name of the tool, a brief description, and an idea of what you're going to use as a group. And then if you need an example, there's one on the next page. And then we're going to come back and you're going to present as a group what, what, you, what you found. OK, so we want to get through this. So um, what we're going to do is um, just start with group one and, and move on. And uh, if we can just have you. Um, introduce what the, what the tool was and let us know what you discovered with it. Our first one was the family meeting and it's a time, um, a set time to communicate with each other. Um, a weekly meeting perhaps. What page is that on? 104. 105? 105. So if you wanted to follow along. And some ideas for use are as a, a way to communicate to everyone within the family to solve problems, uh, come up with different solutions, uh, go over what the positives are for uh, people within the family, and give everyone a job, rotate uh, the moderators so that each person feels like they're of value. And then a time to set expectations, and maybe go over the schedule of what um, people are doing, uh, who has piano practice or a recital and band. And then our second was on communicating, and that was on page 84. 84. Page 84. And then this is a time our, to learn how to listen and validate feelings. Um, and it's one of those things you just have to practice, practice, practice. Um, know where and when is a safe place for your kids to talk to you. Uh, one person said that their child uh, talks well in the car when she doesn't have to see your face. And correct in private and make it a 10 to 1 on praise to correction. So try to keep praising up there. Keep your emotions at bay and keep your attention on the child that's trying to do the communicating. Great.
So what did you think of those tools? Did you think that they were useful? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Communicating is when isn't it a problem? <laughs> so the, the tools at least help you. Any comments on, on either one of the tools? Uh, well, I think the family meeting is a really, um, and I've read different things about family meeting before, which is where, uh, you know, it's helpful to have everyone involved and change who uh, each time as to who it is that's going to lead the family meeting. Great. Okay, where's group two? You know, I think uh, our first tool was self-esteem, reinforcing, assessing and reinforcing self-esteem. And that's on page 94. Yes, thank you. And I think for us, we kind of actually started with ideas first. It was just kind of weird, you know, it just spurred this awesome um, discussion. And so we kind of went to ideas first. But, you know, just how we can figure out how our kids feel about themselves and helping them feel good about themselves. Um, we talked about, um, you know, focusing on strengths and really being involved um, with our kids, with their activities. Um, one of the most important things we thought was active listening, um, just really listening to them, which, like the first group said, takes a lot of practice. Um, lots of praises and positive reinforcement, but not just praising, you know, praising effort and good tries to, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, rewards, um, introducing new activities for them to try, um, and having patience. Um, Anything else you guys want to add? Okay. Um, the second tool that we had was about respect, teaching respect, parents' roles in teaching respect. Um, and we thought this was... And that's on page 112. Page 112, yes. Um, this was a lot to do with communication. Um, we talked about... Um, preparing them for situations and modeling respect. You know, a lot of our kids um, come into our homes and, you know, they may not know anything about respect. They haven't seen respect, you know, so we have to kind of show them, you know, telling them what respect means and, and how to be respectful is one thing, but showing them is something else. And even working with other kids or older kids in our home to role model for the younger kids or the newer kids that are coming into our homes. Um, setting good boundaries. Um, and really being involved with the whole, the whole community network. You know, we talked a lot about being involved in schools and churches and any kind of community activity and working with those um, support people about um, what you're working on your kids with so that they can reinforce that too with them. Um, talking about differences and exposing them to different cultures, um, different things like that. Great. Great. Okay. Number three, group three. Ours is starting on 106. It's a problem-solving strategy that fits into that family meeting schema. In the, if you have a problem, you meet as a family, and it doesn't mean that this is the only type of family meeting you need to have. Uh, in this uh, schema for the uh, problem-solving, at first you have your group together, and it should be the entire family, one person states the problem. Then each person states a feeling, and all of this is done with no interruption and no judgments. Each person lists potential solutions, then each person edits the list of solutions. You write the remaining solutions with assignments for each person, so no one is omitted from the problem. Set review times in two to three weeks, usually, it's of course dependent upon the problem. And then revise the problem at the next meeting according to what helped to solve the problem and which didn't. And then repeat that process as needed and frequency there again depending upon the results. Here's some examples. Um, those that you would present would be to clean the kitchen after use, dating, curfew hours, use of the automobile, bike, etc., clothing choices. And those not presented would be child abuse, drug rehab, unlawful behavior. Um, our second tool was on page 95, and it was the six rules for making responsible decisions. Mm. And that was basically, like, instead of jumping to know when your child asks you for something or to do something, you go over with them why you said no and um, so that they can learn 
how to judge appropriate appropriateness of choices and um, like you're supposed to just ask yourself is it safe is it legal does it conflict with other responsibilities and stuff like that just so that they understand why you said that and here's a few uses some uses would be extracurricular act activities such as sports, a job, hobbies, um, social activities such as dances, dating, makeup wearing, clothes styles, uh, and then um, social responsibilities and privileges such as driving and or seeking medical advice. Sometimes um, foster parents throughout these trainings have come up with their their own guidelines to add to this. and. Um, six rules for making responsible decisions one group said we'll make seven and that is the seventh question is can I live with myself <laughs> once I've once I've made this choice sort of like the overarching one um, any other particular um, particular have, have any of you used problem-solving strategies in your own practice or in in being a foster parent sure. uh, in my own family um, I've had the brilliant idea of accepting a much higher paying job in Alaska and I was single parenting at the time with two teenagers my own two teenagers and so I decided to present this at the family meeting I was immediately overruled <laughs> because they had felt they had too many transitions in their life they felt stable they needed the continuity and they were quite willing to uh, do without financially so they could maintain emotionally. So uh, mama didn't always win. <clears throat> okay, what are we on? Four? Four. <laughs> I can't count today. Yeah, I'm just uh, serving as spokesman, but our group was uh, Pat and Joe and George, and I'm Michael, and we all had feedback. And we basically took the tools and then just decided to discuss what, what it was that we practically did in situations. So it went from the page into our own experiences. And the first things we came up with uh, was, well, pages were 102 and 135, but I kind of want to get away from that. Uh, the first thing we came up with was preventative tools, because that's part of the idea of this, uh, of the seminar. And we talked about discussion first in, in preventing anger, in having dinner table discussions, talking with kids once a week. I think you recommended that, George, as I remembered it. You talked about getting together, you know, having these little um, discussions. And then also in giving the kids an option on different things so you don't force them into a corner immediately so that kids know that there's an option. They don't have to just do it one way for one size fits all. So that was sort of our preventative approach. Now we were the angry group and so <laughs> uh, one of the things I really enjoyed about our group was we talked about the warning signals. And this was composite, loud voices, swearing, um, facial expressions, watch those, whining, crying, frustration, all these different emotional vents. and. Uh, Pat mentions uh, stomping down the street, stomping in, stomping out. So these are actual warning signs or telltale signs that you might look for before something happens. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really an important piece of the puzzle. We all did, actually. So then we went from there to talk about um, what to do when it happens. And we said, first of all, the adults must stay calm, that you keep your voice low, you don't raise your voice, you don't rise to the same level of activity that um, the child exhibits. Mm -hmm. So you simply, you know, you need to use your own calming techniques to begin with to get them to calm down. So you don't want to up the ante physically and emotionally. Part of the idea was, I think Pat mentioned it, and I think Joe, everybody mentioned, was maybe moving them physically out of the zone wherever it's happening to a different place. Mm -hmm. And that can be distracting for them they get thrown off. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you go outside, you're playing catch, you go out on the porch, you sit down, you're in a whole different physical situation, which I thought was a really good idea, to get them out of that immediate physical confrontation, whatever it is. So moving into a different zone, Pat amazed me by saying that she took, sometimes they would go out to the car 
and sit in the car. And I thought, gee, that sounds really dangerous to me. But she said, no, you know, get him in the car. You can talk to him in the car. Maybe that's, maybe that's a good calming place. It's a non-threatening non yeah. place. Yeah. Which I thought was just a, an, an idea that had never occurred to me. You know, I, would, I guess on impulse, I would say, don't go into the car. So good for you know, good for you for mentioning well, it. Don't go in the car. Turn the key with the garage door closed. Is what <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, don't go in the car and aim it at right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Please don't. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, people talked about this as part of the listening skill. It's mentioned on page 135. Is to um, let them vent, give them a chance to say what they have to say without um, co-opting them and cutting them off, because then it takes away their expression, whatever was the source of it, which I thought was really important is to just let them vent for a little bit. And that doesn't mean physically vent, but to verbally vent, which, I, which just seems like a very good technique before you try to do any kind of intervention. Um, George came up, or no, actually I think it was you, Joe, that mentioned, here's another thing that hadn't occurred to me, but physical touching, but in a very gentle way, a gentle hand on the shoulder, or maybe a gentle hand on the back, Nothing extravagant, but simply a way to let them know. And Joe even mentioned hugging them. And this, this kind of was interesting to me because it almost was counterintuitive to maybe dealing with somebody in a physical situation is that if you could deal with them in a positive physical way, that that might help diffuse them. So I just love the fact that people came up with these different ways of approaching things. Um, activities, let them know that you love them. Uh, apologizing, we talked about at the end of the process or somewhere during the process, an apology. But that could also be by the adult as well. It's like, I'm really sorry, you know, that you feel this way. I'm sorry that you're going through this. Mm -hmm. What can I do to help you? So I think maybe apologies all the way around are always a good idea. And so what I wanted to say, uh, I think what I noticed about our group was and what is missing in this manual, mm -hmm. how to handle anger is it uh, doesn't tell you what, the, what leads up to the anger. It doesn't tell you the symptoms to look for. What's missing here is it doesn't show you what precedes the anger. So I really like the fact that we came up with these telltale warning signs that you might look for mm -hmm. so that you don't just get landed on all of a sudden and say, well, where did that come from? Yeah. And that's missing. It's not even in here. Yeah, I, I think that um, what they're trying, what the, what the book is trying to do is to, handle, is to handle the anger itself versus the actual catalyst. And getting mm -hmm. to the anger itself, or the source of it, is why you're actively listening to them, right. why you're saying that you love them, why, right. you, you know, why you want to make sure the communication is open so you can get at that original reason. Because you're absolutely correct. If you don't figure out what exactly is the catalyst for the anger, you might as well be banging your head against a wall because you're never going to get anywhere. Oh, the other thing would be don't bang your head against the wall. Right. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Don't bang their head against the wall. <laughs> and don't bang your head against the wall right. because then that's head banging and we don't want to encourage head banging. Earlier I would said that you know these are just guidelines. These aren't necessarily hard and fast um, rules for making sure that your child lives a productive life that you have as foster parents and other, uh, other support um, professionals you have the ability to to come up with ways to use these guidelines within the context of your own experience. So, you know, removing a child from a situation that is potentially um, that is potentially you know even more angering. You know, just by virtue of being in the house and having the situation happen in that very space, sometimes can be just the same the thing that motivates a child to remain angry. So, taking them out of the situation. Um, Excellent, excellent. No suggestion. slam dunks. No slam dunks. Right. And it's amazing if, if you were brought up in, in a completely different type of, of family environment um, to where you know you had parents who didn't overreact with anger and things like that, and and then you you become foster parents and you get these children and they just you don't realize how angry you can really get. And so even learning yourself, I had to learn that with my son. I had no idea how well he was able to push my buttons. And people talk about that, but I mean, my button could, it must have been huge because he would touch it every time. So my husband and I had always worked together because he was one that could always stay calm and he would walk by scratching his nose when I started getting into a debate with him. And so we always had these kind of cues, but I could always tell, you know, when he was going to get angry or my daughter will start getting angry. And, and you do. Each child is different. You start learning things like that. That we can express our anger, too, mm -hmm. and still communicate well with kids. When they get angry, there is a catalyst for it, 
but you have to validate their anger first and then figure out how they can deal with it because a lot of times they don't feel they have the right in the way we approach it as adults they have to be validated first um, instead of saying well you have you, you shouldn't be angry over this this is this isn't right you know they have to be validated in there and then figure out how to solve that problem and go from there one of the things that you had mentioned or your group had mentioned about because your concern was how do you separate um, I'm not as as parents I'm not angry with you I'm angry with your behavior or or you know whatever it is that you've done I'm angry with you and I'm not going to knock you down on the floor right exactly <laughs> and I think I think that what your group also said was saying, I love you unconditionally, but some things that you do really press my buttons sometimes. <laughs> so it's important to delineate, you know, to try as much to, when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to discipline or talk to your child about any of this stuff, to make sure that in this category is their behavior and in this category is their person. And to try to keep those separate, because sometimes it's hard to do that. I have found that it's always important day by day to show them that you love them. Mm -hmm. An automatic, you know, in some ways, small ways, big ways, doesn't really matter. But to show them that you love them so when they do get angry at whatever it is, whether it's you or something else, no matter how they act out, they know they're safe and they can come to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an ongoing process that you just have to do it on a day by day basis, even if they're, everything is great, just to show them that you love them. Mm -hmm and then they'll feel safe coming to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. and that they're... takes a while to build up. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it can't just be intermittent or kind of convenient, you know. No, Only when you get angry. It's That's unconditional. Also, I love you. <laughs> has to be unconditional. Right, <laughs> right. I have um, two daughters that are ADD, and the one daughter is especially a mean, nasty, not nice person in the morning. And uh, she, it's very impulsive, and what we've found works really well with her is since her anger isn't really directed at, it's just everything, is that we send her outside and tell her <laughs> that we do not act this way and say these things in our house. Uh, if you'd like to go outside and when you're ready to come in and act appropriately how we act in this family, please come back and join us. And sometimes it takes her a while to get herself together, sometimes it doesn't. But it gives, it lets her be in control of we're in control of how you act in the house and you're in control of when you want to come back and join us and act that way. But she, she buys into this. It's mm -hmm. not like she's being pushed out of the, mm -hmm. get out. Okay, so just make it Well, when the neighbor came out and saw her standing there in her pajamas and asked if she uh, was locked <laughs> out, she came right back in. <laughs> uh, one thing over time is to teach a child what it, feels like for them, have them be aware of their own body when they're starting to build anger. Uh, if they can feel it and then have a way of coping with it, maybe go rip boxes, play with model clay, go shoot hoops, find an alternative way if they can stop just the anger burst and then you have a more realistic way of dealing with the problem rather than dealing with the problem and the anger. We have color tables all over our house, and so when my daughter gets angry, she's learned what we've set up to give her a tool. Is she goes over and she scribbles on a piece of paper, and so she scribbles, 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 scribble, and then she wads it up and throws it across the room instead of wailing on her sister. <laughs> and it's worked really well. It's actually worked really well, and it calms her just immediately. Just that whole process. Does anybody remember Dr. Spock? Oh yeah. He recommended <laughs> he recommended milk or or calcium. And I make my girls that were fighting at that moment stop and have a calcium pill, and they worked marvelous. Well. <laughs> to stop, just to stop and have yeah. a well, calcium pill. I, it actually changes. Your mood. You mean like a, like if they're angry and yelling at each yeah. other, you say stop, take your pill. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever works. A chill Every pill. Every child okay. is different. Well, it's sort of like a placebo effect. It kind of goes along with that. Okay. <laughs> Any, any more thoughts about it? Because we could probably talk about this all day. <laughs> and you're going to find a lot of tools out there. Linda kids me all the time with pre service about like Super Nanny. I watch Super Nanny a lot. And there's a lot of tools in there that we've been able to use that will, that will 
you know, that you can curb the, the anger that's happening and then also show the love at the same time. It's, it's phenomenal that I've tried a lot of these techniques and, and they are amazing. So there's a lot out there. You just kind of have to open your eyes and see. Yes, it does. And, and it is the Nazi mat that makes the difference. <laughs> okay. We're on number five. Well, we kind of did a little compilation of uh, talking about fears in early childhood and tips to uh, address an uh, anxious child. Um, some of the things that we talked about that we could do to help alleviate that situation is to listen to the child, play act with the child, go through the issues that they're upset about or fearful of, help them understand the issue. If they're upset with airplanes or loud noises, we can talk through those issues with them. Assess their uh, TV viewing. Uh, there might be shows that they have an inclination to, to watch that might have uh, maybe too much violence and causing them anxiety. So no desperate housewives? Probably not. <laughs> okay. We probably need to be aware of how much we're arguing. If they come from a violent background, uh, they might not be able to fully process arguing or heated discussions that take place within the household. Explain to them what is real as contrasted to imaginary things. Some of the things we can do to help them might be to provide night lights, uh, buy them a flashlight if they're uh, fearful of the night. Uh, encourage them to draw these scary things, these imaginary things, uh, or even write stories about the things that are causing them the anxiety or the fear. Um, a good thing to do also is to have a steady, consistent bedtime routine for these kids when they go to bed. A uh, certain time to go to bed, maybe a glass of milk and cookies or whatever, and just keep that uh, consistency uh, with them, particularly in the nighttime when the fear usually arises. That's excellent. So let's talk a little bit about the media, the media influence. Um, how often do you guys feel like uh, media has an impact on, on enhancing kids' fears? <laughs> Probably pretty significant. Oh, it does it to me. Yeah, all right, even cartoons. Not only fear, but their anger management. They get so much on their Nintendo or whatever, their games, that they go out the door with methods of coping with anger that... That are not... That are not very conducive to, sure, exactly. Um, I don't know if you, this, I may have not, or I may have mentioned this or not mentioned. I work on the weekends as a psychiatric social worker, because during the week I don't have enough to do. Um, so um, I have. Um, have. Have any of you ever seen The Princess Bride? That oh, movie. Yes. Oh, all of you. Oh, great! It's a wonderful movie. I love it. Um, it's a. It's a great flick. I really. I, I really really enjoy it. Um, and so we put it on for our patients, who are you know, they're they're adults. They're all over the age of eighteen, and there's a. I mean, despite that it's a wonderful film, there is a scene in there where somebody is put into this torture chamber, and he's got these, you know, things on his things on him, and he's um, he's in pain. And several of our patients couldn't watch it; they had a really tough. We had to turn it off immediately. So now I've been very hyper vigilant about what I allow to be shown on the unit um, because of these same reactions. I mean, for example, Harry Potter. Um, I've read all of the Harry Potter books. I love them immensely. But sometimes the actual films themselves can be quite scary. You know, Chamber of Secrets with a giant snake coming after you um, is kind of scary. And these are geared for, you know, these are geared for adolescent kids who sometimes can't tell the difference between real and imaginary, especially if it's in that kind of real mode versus a cartoon. So anyway, just some, just some food for thought. Anybody have any experience with watching television or, or movies or film or whatever? And, and it has, and then your child has a problem going to sleep or having nightmares. Yeah. Uh, I have all kinds of situations that have happened in my lifetime that, um, if I um, see this similar situation on television, I just turn the mute button off and turn my head the other way and and watch the. Uh, program for general content instead of what's happening, but I don't think kids really uh, think about doing something like that. My grandson, on the other hand, I up until just recently, he wouldn't watch 
and he's he's almost 10. He wouldn't watch violent programs at all mm -hmm. until he started playing Nintendo games and things like that. And now he does. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of train him, I think. Uh, I'm issue, I have issues with my six-year-old wanting to karate chop her sister, so <laughs> even things with a different movement in it. Ow. This goes back probably 15 years ago. I, without meeting my daughter, my oldest daughter, who is now 44 years old, but any, anyway, her son and, and, and husband were there, and after we got through eating, this is out of Gig Harbor area, I went out a little early, and in that particular set of hallway, there was a whole process in Nintendo games in there just absolutely full of them and right away my grandson he's only about four years old at the time and his dad was in there and there was one other kid two or three other kids in there and I just as I walked out it just dawned on me because I was seeing what they were playing everything was blood and kill and I, I'm not somebody that says censor everything because that's not how I feel about it but boy I do believe there is a connection there somewhere in there if parents are really watching that stuff and really checking on what their kids are doing. I think it does play images. How can you watch it all? You can't be with them every second. That's true. Right. That's true. I have positive ones too, like the sports. Positive sports games? Yeah. Sure. Excellent. I think when they first came out, they didn't have a lot of that positive stuff. I really believe they have done some cleanup, which is good. Super, Super Mario Brothers, correct. It's amazing with cartoons, just the um, how innocent that you think they are until you watch them and hmm. just little things in there our uh, children's psychiatrist told us to look at all the Disney movies and that most of the Disney movies there is no mother in the picture that they prey on a child's worst fear and that's the loss of their uh, parents it, yeah it's to pull the emotional and, side out mm -hmm. yeah and we took a foster child to see Lilo and Stitch when it came out we'd had her for three days that kid was hysterical. Uh, the caseworker is trying to take the child away from her sister. And it's like, we had no idea that this is what we were going to go see with a child who just came into foster care. And I've used, I've used the uh, Disney Tarzan to explain to my daughter about adoption because of how, you know, they, you physically, I mean, you see uh, Tarzan losing his family and then the, the gorillas had adopted him and how he dealt with that. So now we have group six, which, and this is a decent segue into what they're going to talk about. What our um, toolbox is goes right along with what everyone was just talking about as far as the movies and television and video games, and it's uh, building and balancing electronic usage in your home in regards to TV, video, and internet. Make sure you monitor how much TV that your kids wa watch, set limitations, uh, control the game related spending, and also misuse, misusage and also overusage of TVs and video games and stuff like that. Uh, and that was basically it with the brief description, the brief description of usage. One thing that, um, that we kind of come up with was the fact that we'd like the children to bring up um, some offers and ideas to help implement and to help write up a plan for them and the consequences so they can, um, they can be accountable for their actions. So kind of include them, and also to provide the children um, to pick appropriate TV movies, TV shows, um, appropriate games, and actually like take them to the pawn shop so they could get games for like three to five bucks as also a kind of incentive for their positive reinforcement. And then um, when problems arise, such as overusage, homework not being done, or misuses of expectations like if you get up in the middle of the night and see them playing video games, obviously at the wrong appropriate time, then obviously there'll be consequences for them. And also um, to have the children show responsibilities and be able to follow um, through with these, like always having frequent discussions with your children um, about conversations on the internet and messages. And the internet does have, like MSN, has a parent control on there to where you could actually, when they're um, MSNing their friends, you could actually have the conversation all recorded. So you actually do know what they're talking about. It's always good to keep in tune to your children. <laughs> But so a um, tip would be to keep up with current technology because I'm not sure yes. many people know that in the room that you can look at cookies and other things online to see what your kids are actually talking about online, which can be somewhat scary <laughs> on occasion. Right. 
and then also continue this conversation with them and whenever problems arise make sure you hurry up and nip it quick. What I particularly like is that they refer to tell as sort of like a diet like you know how much how much you consume sort of you know similar you don't want to just mindlessly sit there and just soak it all up you know in your um, any thoughts about that versus how and how that compares to like nutrition or um, getting in, getting enough or too much or too little? Go ahead. I liked how also the book even brought out some different activities that you could do and encourage other activities like even walks or not just TV activities but other activities like role playing like if they like a certain show then let's role play the show and wear costumes and stuff. Too much TV or too much of anything is not good for a child. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I had to. I know that um, my daughter one time even just pushed in model on the internet. And when model pops up on the internet, because she, you know, a lot of teenage girls want to at least look at that avenue. Well, all of a sudden, all these naked pictures just start popping up everywhere. And so it's really dangerous to let the kids always, I always like to keep the computer in the kitchen where all the activity, you could walk by and mm -hmm. you will just look at their screen. There's no way they could pop it down so quick for you. Right. It's a surprising, so a child who may not necessarily be um, searching out for this stuff, well, you know, I, I think what is, I, wh how, it's a ridiculous percentage of the amount of uh, inappropriate material that is downloaded every day from, for, uh, from the internet. Like it's mostly used for, um, it's mostly used for sexual material. So I think that um, it's you know whether or not you want to get it in your in your in your search engine, um, sometimes you're going to get it whether you like it or not. And so and kids, um, if we're savvy enough, we can prevent them from oh please don't click there or don't take a look at this or or to keep in mind that these things might be out there. So it's a good idea to um, to be uh, smart about about the kind of things that, that might pop up. So excellent job. Well, um, one more thing really oh, quick sure. is that we do not set a double standard in our house. We don't have videos that are for the kids and videos that are for us. We don't allow anything in our house. It is anything more than PG. And we don't, um, we only ha let them have video games that we preview. I don't think a seven and nine year old can, um, are, are good judges of what they can and cannot watch because if they had a choice they'd watch every scary movie in the book and and so again we, we just bring into our home what we will allow them to see and we do not let them have the um, remote control for the television uh, we set the television program and that's what they're going to watch and um, and that's it you know the children our children and we are the adults and so we have the responsibility of uh, monitoring what they do do so again, the the role modeling of what you of what you would watch versus yes yeah yes, and we don't we don't turn on a television program we wouldn't want them to watch and make them leave the room. Mm -hmm. We just don't watch it. Somebody yeah. said something about um, checking uh, their emails. Uh, I think you have to be real careful when you do that kind of thing and just. Uh, maybe scan for particular words that might be a warning, you know, like if somebody's always threatening murder or uh, always using the word kill mm -hmm. or uh, words like that rather than reading the whole thing because you, you really are getting awful close to invading privacy for the older kids especially. Right. But a lot of it's encoded now. A lot of these kids come up with their own language yeah, and their own codes. True. Well, yeah, my, my son had that a lot. You can't interpret it anyway if that's the case. Right. I ask my kids what words are. Do you? Or you ask? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, but agreed that, you know, if you've got a child who's an adolescent, you know, especially at a time of development when they're trying to assert their independence, <laughs> they're not necessarily going to be too jazzed about you reading their diary or their emails or their private stuff. So, yeah, excellent. There, George, did you? Yeah, I, just had a I, I made a mistake several years ago. I let uh, one of my foster kids, boys, uh, have a computer in his bedroom. <laughs> uh, it went on for one quarter, and then I got his report card, and I said, my gosh, what's happened here? You know, you, you, you were doing really good, and now you're down to D's and C's. Well, he was up all night watching uh, on the computer, <coughs> and that was a struggle. I mean, I, the kid really lost it when I extracted that computer out of his room, and I'd never do it again. It, and as a matter of fact, in my house, they have certain hours, but then... I am right there because just what we're talking about, the pornography, 
uh, all this junk mail that they can go into these <laughs> chat rooms and stuff. They don't need that. Mm -hmm. They really don't need it. But you've got to monitor them. We're very, very close. Because they're, they're, they know how to get on to that stuff. <laughs> Our, our biggest challenge in our house is our grandparents because they keep wanting to buy them computers for their rooms and TVs for their rooms and it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> our tool consists of three checklists, the pediatric symptom checklist, the issues checklist, and the middle childhood checklist. And those are on pages? Uh, 17, 16 through 18, 49 through 50, and 46. So 16 um, through one, 18. 49 through 50 and 46. The first one, the pediatric symptom checklist, um, is for the parents to look at, okay, you know, your child is having behaviors, but this really kind of breaks it down, fine tunes it. You can kind of assess what ones are they having a lot, a little. Um, it's a tool then you can use with taking the child to the doctor or talking with teachers or talking with therapists. Um, it's a good way to assess a new child in the home and then kind of maybe go back and look at them down the road again and see what's, what's changed, what's increased, what's not. Um, the issues checklist, uh, again, it talks about where you go through with the child and what things, what topics keep coming up and again, again and again and how do you feel about it. I kind of looked at it as kind of picking your battles. It's a good tool to then help you pick your battles as what things you are going to um, have to address and or what buttons do get pushed and then what to do about it. Um, and the third issue, one is the middle childhood checklist. Again, it talks about not only issues in the home, but issues then with friends, issues with school, issues in the community. And again, these are all um, kind of guidelines to then, okay, if there's issues that brought up, then what's the next step? Which issues are recurring? Which issues might then need more intervention from a therapist or somebody at school? So these are all really good condensed tools to use. Excellent. And, and having that information ahead of time just makes you able to answer those questions quicker. Because it never fails that after you leave an appointment, you go, oh, I should have mentioned this and should have mentioned that. Right. So. And then you can do it and then down the road do it again and see what's changed, what symptoms or what issues are still there or that might have alleviated or what was major one time might not be later on. Exactly. Definitely good for the journaling that you do with your kids so that you have that history of, of what's been going on with them. And, yeah, definitely those charts are great to use. Oh. Thank you. Well, folks, um, any last thoughts about about the the exercise that you just went through? I know it's kind of it was kind of uh, a little brain racking to go through this stuff, especially um, when uh, you might be you might be used to not having to go through particular tools like this. But any thoughts about how you might use them or um, how practical they are? Very practical. <laughs> so good.